Welcome back, everybody, to Altcoin Daily. We are joined with a very special guest today, a Bitcoin OG, a man who brought Uber to every city in America, built some of the most popular early crypto products, including ChangeTip, acquired by Airbnb, ZeroBlock, acquired by Blockchain, and Interchange, acquired by Kraken Exchange, and he is now the business the Director of Business Development at Kraken, the great and powerful Dan Held. How are you doing today? Making me blush over here, guys. That's that's quite the intro. <laughs> I've, I've survived this long in the crypto space, so I, I guess that's saying something. I'm not sure if you can see the gray hairs popping in. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, crypto years are like dog years, so it's felt like an eternity. I know, they are like dog years. So uh, what's the agenda today, Aaron? Well, I'm excited to have Dan on because Dan, been, been in the space for a while. He's good at breaking down hard concepts. And basically what we're going to be doing today is taking questions from the audience. We have some questions and we're just going to be picking Dan's brain and hopefully we all, we all learn a little something, right? That's right. And I think we both have a hard out at around 1 p.m. LA time. So we'll make it short, sweet, and good. Cool. So yeah, I guess First question, how are you feeling about the overall state of Bitcoin today? What are you most excited about? Yeah, so I think, you know, back when I first got into it in 2012, <laughs> the Bitcoin QT, the Bitcoin Core wallet, was my first wallet, which was a, <laughs> it had a full node with it. So I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <clears throat> I'm not a, I didn't come from uh, tech or engineering. I came from a finance background. And so for me, <clears throat> for me having that as my first wallet, was hugely confusing. I didn't know what public private keys were. I was like, why does my wallet have to sync with this thing called a blockchain? It was tremendously difficult. Um, also to buy Bitcoin, I had to wire money to Japan, to Mt. Gox, which took like three to seven days. And you know, I'm crossing my fingers, it gets there. I mean, Bitcoin at that time was still very shady. Like it, it was very shady, um, really hard to use. And so as the years progressed, you know, Mt. Gox collapsed. We weren't sure if Bitcoin is going to come back. Silk Road got shut down. We weren't sure if that was the driving demand factor for Bitcoin. And later we would find out like, oh, because of its use in dark markets isn't what drives demand ultimately. You know, a month after Silk Road collapsed, Bitcoin 10 x and went from $100 to, to 1000 at the end of 2013. And so, you know, how I'm feeling about Bitcoin now is we've gone through all these struggles. Like we've, we've seen Bitcoin ebb and flow over the years. And, and we've seen, you know, the space had all these structural issues, you know, like Mt. Gox was 90% of exchange volume. Um, you know, you had different companies that uh, the space was dependent on. If, and if they had failed, Bitcoin would have been in a really bad spot. You know, where we are now is super strong. And Bitcoin itself has resisted a civil war with the Bcashers. Um, and has fended off attacks from Ethereum and other chains in terms of narrative attacks where people go, the flipping will occur and and currencies and money are reflexive so as more people believe in it it grows stronger in price and that price grows more and more adoption so these narratives are critical to defend and bitcoin defended itself both on the narrative side on the business side and the technical side and so bitcoin has never been stronger you know i've waited eight years to see this moment the, the protocol is strong the exchange infrastructure side is strong there's tons of open source development. There's tons of new wallets and GUIs and interfaces that we can use that are much more intuitive for humans versus the old Bitcoin uh, QT client that I had back you know, eight years ago. Um, and then we've got this macro backdrop of you know, big financial crisis. You know, the COVID-19 COVID essentially creating this huge, huge issue with the, the overall economy. Um, you know, Bitcoin was built and, and planted in this moment in 2008 as an antidote to poor central banking policy and we're about to print a literal infinity amount of fiat money. And there's only 21 million Bitcoin and Bitcoin has survived this long. Everything's ready to go. It's the way I, I kind of liken it is that it's like a, uh, it's like a play. The orchestra is in the pit, the conductor, or, you know, the people are all ready to, to begin the play. All the actors and actresses are in place. The sets, the set and the backgrounds are all set up. We just need the market to begin. And then when we begin, this is the, this is the game that I, this is the play that I've been waiting for. Um, so I couldn't be more bullish is the answer, the short answer. He's never been more excited, ladies and gentlemen. That's always fun to hear. And and there will be people that watch this scream in the stream in the replay that don't really understand, um, get the big deal about Bitcoin. Yeah, for those new people, like what is it about Bitcoin 
what value, is, value proposition? Yeah, what is the value proposition of Bitcoin for somebody who's never heard of it? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, whenever I'm approached with this, it's typically dependent, you know, I try to craft a narrative dependent on the individual. You've got millennials and Zoomers and boomers, different age groups, male, female, different backgrounds, finance folks, technical folks. I would say like the overarching theme is that Bitcoin was built as a antidote to poor central banking policy. Satoshi planted Bitcoin in the middle of the 2008 financial crisis at that peak moment of despair, right after Lehman Brothers collapsed. And he did that and he wrote in the first block in the blockchain, UK chancellor on the verge of second bailout for banks because Bitcoin was meant to replace central banks and replace government monies. And that's good because over throughout history, over and over again, we've seen these central banks abuse that power and print more money than they had in backing in gold or print more money than was necessary. And this is due to the political apparatus getting them involved with the money printing apparatus, is that there are all sorts of mixed incentives for central banks and governments to print as much money as possible. Now, Bitcoin is the opposite of that. It's got a 21 million hard cap. So essentially what we're talking about is an infinity of fiat money that will perpetually be printed from all these different governments and only 21 million Bitcoin. And so the value prop for consumers and, and users all across the world is that you can store your wealth in Bitcoin. It's not dependent on any government. You don't have to trust any government. You don't have to trust a bank and you can store that wealth over time. Now, people would go, oh, Bitcoin's very volatile in price. And what I mean by store of values, I mean, it's immutability. So I can send it and receive it anywhere without requiring permission. And I can store it very securely, which means that it's very hard to seize. I can memorize it and put it in my head. I can put it on a piece of paper. I can put it on a hardware device or I can have it on a server. And so due to that really hard to seize nature of it, that completely changes the dynamic of citizens and their government and how wealth is preserved. Uh, right now, the government could call a Bank of America and say, freeze all the bank accounts. Boom, instantly, all that money's locked up, trillions of dollars. Whereas in Bitcoin, that's not possible. And so when I mean store of value, that's what I mean by that. The stable purchasing power, like a dollar, uh, you know, the dollar stays relatively stable in terms of what it can purchase. That remains stable because it's centrally controlled. So when people hear store of value, they go, wait, Bitcoin's antithetical to that because it's volatile. No, it's a good store of value due to its other parameters as money and it's good censorship resistant or seizure, seizureship resistant nature. Um, so Bitcoin is like the gold 2.0 for the world. This is what I want to go to the chat in just a second. And I want to talk about your YouTube channel and take a little break and do that in just a second. But, uh, you know, this is what I think. I think and see if you agree with this or what you think about this. I think, you know, Bitcoin has now been around 11 years and a huge part of something like this, like money, is that trust aspect that, you know, you've got to trust it's going to be around. And in 1995, although the Internet has been around in some form for decades, in 1995, the internet was new to a lot of people and you get Katie Corrick and a bunch of people going, well, I don't really see a point, it's hard to use. But cut to 10 years later to 2005 and everybody had just pretty much accepted the internet is here to stay. So like, you know, I would think sometime in the next 10 years that switch is going to flip for, for everybody. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question when it comes to adoption of these new technologies and these new monies. These are long, long arcs. You know, you might remember back to when you were younger and everybody got a smartphone and all the younger people your age got smartphones, but then your parents still had a flip phone. You know, they, these technologies take a long time to replace, or I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this, but there's cassette players that you would put into your car and they would plug into your iPhone. Oh, we remember. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I forget how long, like when these things phased out or not, but that, you know, that was kind of a stopgap measure between cassettes and, you know, having the aux cable plugged right into your, your uh, you know, I mean, I grew up with cassette players and CDs, then aux cables, and then uh, Bluetooth. You know, so I've seen that whole spectrum and I feel like millennials were the first analog to digital age group. So we were one of the first ones to be able to understand Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin challenges, you, challenges your core assumptions over money and government and incentives and the production of money and what money does as a purpose. You know, so it, it's really hard for people to grok and grok, when I say that word, what that means is like understand. It's hard for people to understand what Bitcoin is, what's wrong with their existing system. I mean, most people don't, <laughs> most people don't know how central banks work, right? Like, I don't want to challenge the fundamental nature of my reality, which is what is money and, and what are, what are banks and what is my government? Most people don't want to dive down that rabbit hole. It's like, 
you know, you, you, you're not sitting at the bus stop wanting to like challenge every assumption you've ever held. So it's a process, it takes time. And it's this reflexive process as the price goes up, more people become aware of it, more people come in and speculate in anticipation of the value increasing. And then in the dips, people stick around and, and build that core hodler group, the people that really truly believe in we're at the floor for Bitcoin. And so that increases over time. We have higher lows where we have sort of a stair step function where Bitcoin has this kind of rising floor of believers. And so ultimately, you know, what Bitcoin represents is a belief in all each one of our minds that Bitcoin solves a problem and that's necessary. And we buy into that. Um, and that's the way that you would kill Bitcoin as well as you'd have to kill each one of our beliefs in Bitcoin. So each, you'd have to convince each individual that they're wrong about Bitcoin for Bitcoin to die. It's really more of an idea that lives in all of our heads. And that idea is enabled by code that we can all validate and, and look at and we don't have to trust anyone. I like it. We did have a question from the audience. Cool, yeah, let's take a question. Let's uh, see how many viewers we got. Let's do all that stuff and we'll go sure. to the YouTube channel. We have 880 people watching. Appreciate you all. And we have 230 likes. It would be great for Dan, get those likes above 250. But taking a question from you, and I forget who asked it, but what are your thoughts on stable coins in 2020? And do you see stable coins as possibly a gateway for, for adoption of Bitcoin? Yeah, I definitely do. I was also a fan of Libra. You know, first and foremost, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> hey, we love it, dude. We're a Bitcoin fundamentalist. I know we have the channel called Altcoin Daily, but I don't mind saying, in my personal opinion, all coins will trend towards zero versus Bitcoin given enough time, just my opinion. And we actively make content based on that. Well, thanks for calling that out, guys. And, and yeah, you know, I very much, you know, I think that's why we get along so well. Um, you know, when we think about stable coins and Libra, a lot of times what these coins do is it helps pe challenge people's belief in their government. So, you know, there's a term called a marketing funnel where, you know, you've got like, uh, let's say I want someone to take an Uber and they're, they're a new user who's never taken an Uber before. And so they've heard about Uber, they've signed up for Uber, they've registered and they've done all the KYC, AML and credit card, and then they take their first Uber. And so that's called a marketing funnel. You lose people along the way. And so, you know, sorry, let me, uh, let me close my Slack here. Well, blowing up with the messages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, with Bitcoin, you lose people on the funnel. Um, and when it comes to, you know, really how Bitcoin, you know, how, how do we attract like that new wave? So there's a moment in the movie Inception. We've got Leo DiCaprio talking to Tom Hardy. And Leo goes to Tom because he's trying to convince Tom to join the Inception team. Leo goes to Tom, he goes, I have a crazy idea, it's called Inception. And Tom goes, it's not that crazy of an idea, but we have to start with the core fundamental root of the idea. And so in the movie in Inception, they're trying to convince this uh, son who's about to inherit his father's billions to break up his father's conglomerate empire. And so Tom goes to Leo, he goes, we can't start with breaking up his father's empire. We have to start with the relationship of his father. And so with Bitcoin, similarly, we can't start with Bitcoin we have to start with people's relationship with their government. And so that's what stable coins do. That's what stable coins and Libra do, is it challenges people's assumptions that their government money could be their only money. If there's now other stable fiat money or stable, or <laughs> you could call it, you know, fiat coins more so than stable coins because fiat loses a couple percent a year in inflation. Um, these challenge people's assumptions that only their government can print money. And once they go down that rabbit hole, you know, at the top of the funnel, now they're like, okay, Money's like more digital, less re geo regional specific. And then, oh, wait, what if no government controlled the money? Bitcoin. So I do think it's a good top of the funnel user acquisition channel for Bitcoin. I love it. Um, and that is how it is. It's like you, you hear about Bitcoin once and it just takes so long before you, you know, the, the more you know, the less you know. And it's just, you know, it takes a while. But eventually, just like what we saw in America, I think somebody else tweeted this, though I can't remember who originally said this, but it's like, you know, with coronavirus for the, you know, for months, Americans didn't care about it. And then there was this just tipping point where all of a sudden everybody cared about coronavirus for those two, three weeks. And that, you know, I think that's going to happen with Bitcoin for sure. Yeah. We, you know, we've definitely seen that happen. I've been through the early 13, late 13 and 17 bubbles. So, you know, I've definitely seen that happen where no one cares, no one cares, no one cares, everyone cares. And that's where a lot of people go, Oh, price doesn't matter. No price is everything that matters. And even Satoshi hypothesized, and this is before Bitcoin had any value, Satoshi hypothesized that people would get FOMO and that would be that viral loop 
would be Bitcoin's primary marketing capabilities, which would be even even despite yourselves at, at Altcoin Daily and myself talking about Bitcoin, even without us, the price alone as it rises would fuel that FOMO. People buy into that expectation of increasing value and that increases awareness and adoption. If, if Bitcoin stayed at $10 and was perfectly stable, none of us would be here right now. You know, it's the volatility that brings us in. That is true. And, sure. and speaking of marketing too, on top of that, there has not been, there's, there's never more content than there is today about Bitcoin and crypto. And speaking of that, speaking of that, I do want to pivot a little bit and share my screen real quick. Um, Dan, I want to hear all about your YouTube channel. Let me just set it up. First of all, let me just say, Dan has had his YouTube channel. Link is in the description for anybody who wants to just subscribe. Dan has had his YouTube channel for a while now, but he is just going through a process where he's kind of, um, you know, getting into it uh, and being more proactive with, with, with videos. And before you tell us what it's all about, Dan, I got to say, right now, Dan has 1,620 subscribers. I'm probably the, his number one fan. I want probably 15,000 people are going to see this video before 24 hours passes. I would love to get Dan up to 5,000 subscribers. Link is in the description. I know that's a lofty goal. Can it be done? And what, what you can expect with uh, from Dan is uh, Bitcoin content um, that's easy to understand. And Dan, please tell us more about this. Really appreciate the shout out, guys. Um, you know, like I said, I'm a big fan of y'all's channel as well. And, and I'm new to this, you know, so... Uh, if predominantly a lot of people have, have found out my content and who I am through Twitter. And so I found that YouTube is a really important way to engage with people. I've had a ton of fun helping on other YouTube channels, other crypto YouTube channels, and, uh, you know, started watching y'all's content and really digging in. And I was like, this is a great way to talk about Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, I used to have a TV show called Huddle with Metal, and that was kind of my first foray into film. I guess you could call it that. And this was on Block TV. And so I talk about different topics and we did this for around uh, around a half a year or so and then Block TV recently shut down. So the way I'm looking at doing this is I'm, I'm kind of moving my, my new content that I'm developing on Twitter, moving a lot of that over to here. And the way I'm thinking through it is that I'll probably have a, you know really clean, crisp, sci-fi-esque videos that cover different topics about Bitcoin in a very understandable, you know, high level manner. We're not going to say confusing words like hash and other things like that. We might even have like two videos where one is the technical one and one is like, talk to me like I'm a human, not a robot. And so that's what I think I'm going to do is dig in deep on different Bitcoin topics or like, why is Bitcoin volatile or why is Bitcoin worth anything? You know, very like beginner-esque topics. Um, for me, I think it's critically important. A lot of us in the Bitcoin space, you know, I'm very well connected in terms of these older OG Bitcoiners who you know, we, we've been around for such a long time, we forget what it's like to be a newbie. And I want to make sure we go back to the basics and cover things like, you know, what is money? Why is Bitcoin valuable? And the things I mentioned before, because these are very important, you know, and each one of us, whenever we want to go tell our family or friends about Bitcoin, you know, where do you point them to? It's like, here's a tweet storm, two medium articles, three podcasts, and altcoin daily, you know? So I want to help kind of craft these like little nugget size pieces of wisdom that help convert no coiners into Bitcoiners. I love it. I think what you just said about like people who've been in this space uh, a while, uh, they sometimes forget what it's like to be new. In my opinion, a lot of Bitcoin OGs, Bitcoin maximalists, who I respect, I think they have great points of view. In my opinion, new people coming to them, they're a little short sometimes, or they isolate themselves, just in my opinion. You know, I don't know what your experience is. And, you know, they come to altcoin daily and they think, oh, what's next besides Bitcoin? But then I tell them, hey, no, no, no it's, it's only Bitcoin, you know. Um, but OK, but like so 1,600, we just got 10 more subscribers. Uh, like I said, link in the description. You got to go subscribe to Dan's channel and everybody be looking to see how many um, subscribers he jumps and also give him a chance. Because like I said, his new content is going to be different from this stuff. Give him a chance with a couple of videos to see what he's how often do you think you'll post, Dan? I'm looking for once a week. Uh, I'm currently working with two animators to think about how to do this. So the visuals will be very compelling. It's not just me talking about it. You'll see custom made visuals that I sketched, iterated and designed in Figma that I then hand off to these professional video editors who then take it and animate it. So these will be straight from my hands, visuals and how to explain Bitcoin. So in terms of making something as simple as possible, I'm gonna try to make it as simple as you could possibly do it. Also, you might want to show them the price of Bitcoin. We don't have to do any audio on there, but maybe show them like a 10 second clip. 
Oh yeah. The price, of, the price of Bitcoin. So it'll very much be some of this aesthetic, which is kind of the darker aesthetic. Uh, this was a really fun visualization that I did, which was around Bitcoin's price time lapsed over time. So if you want to know what it feels like to be a Bitcoin hodler since I've been in, watching this gives you a good idea of how many swings I've gone through, how the price went up and down. A lot of times people look back into history and they see, you know, Bitcoin going from $10 to 100 to 1000 and they were like, oh, that was guaranteed, right? Well, we didn't feel that way at $10. We weren't sure where it was going to go. You know, and if we did, the price wouldn't have gone to $10. It'd be much higher because we all would have bid it up. So this, I think this is a really cool visual. So, you know, really clean, black and white, very simple aesthetic is what I'm going to go with. And so I think this is a, a good a good video to kind of show off some of what that might look like. Um, they're not all going to be time lapse, time lapse price charts, but I do think these are interesting and I'll probably explore more with time lapse um, market data and time lapse data as well in the future where we go through different Bitcoin metrics, like maybe the number of active addresses or the amount of transaction fees and see those over time and then talk about it over time. So it'll be, it's a really unique way to look at, at different types of data. And I think it, it, it's hard to understand moments in time when it comes to data. Because we zoom out, we look at the current day and all history, and it all seems to make sense. But we have to go back to what it felt like then. So yeah, this is one example of the type of content I went through. I bet people who bought it $140, but like total losers buying it that high. <laughs> you know, it was funny, I bought it 260 in the peak, the early peak of 2013, and then it crashed to like 80 bucks. And I was like, ah, shit. You know, so <laughs> if, when you're buying Bitcoin now, if you feel like, you, oh, and this, this was pretty depressing when it went down to 180. I remember that exact moment. That was that was pretty peak moment of despair. I sold my company zero block at $1,200 of Bitcoin a year before that, a year and a half before that. So can you imagine hodling that Bitcoin that you sold your company for as it dropped 85%? So for, for Bitcoin, for me, you know, to, to see it grow and, and survive this long is incredible. It's also a great validation that I'm not crazy. Which feels good. Because sometimes when it hit like $180, I had my CPA dad email me going like, hey, should we just sell it all? Like, or should you just sell it all now? And me going, no, I still believe in it. My investment thesis hasn't changed. So, you know, things like this, I think, help give really good perspective as to like what it feels like to be a hodler, what hodling represents. Um, yeah, so yeah, thanks for showing this this little clip, but it, it's it's pretty it's pretty fun to watch it go. I think a lot of people don't really understand what it was like to to hodl through all of that. I like it because it gives you instant perspective, as opposed to you know just sort of the small grasp that some of, when you first got in, that's when you kind of think it starts. But that gives you instant. A lot of people think Bitcoin was just you know 2016, 17 today. They don't realize that it's been around a while. Hey, we have a super chat question for you, Dan, from an audience member, Hypersonic. He says to Dan, what do you perceive as the largest threat slash hurdle to Bitcoin? That's part one. And part two, what's your favorite beverage, alcoholic or not? Great content, guys. Well, I'll start with the alcoholic one first. Um, I love a good uh, scotch. So I've got Laphroaig in my, uh, my bar cabinet right now. Also, Macallan 12 is a good go-to. And then if I'm feeling a little bit cheaper, you got like the, uh, you got Maker's Mark or Bullet Bourbon, you know, so if, if my buddy's buying around and I don't want to break the bank, those are what I go for. Um, you know, the biggest threat to Bitcoin, I think is, is again, Bitcoin can only die if we all stop believing in it, because that's the only reason why the dollar has value or gold has value is the aggregate shared belief in it. And so to kill Bitcoin, I think would take require a pretty sustained amount of like government pressure. Um, I think Bitcoin is still somewhat fragile at this moment when it comes to its, its ability to, to resist government pressure. Um, so, for example, like if all the U.S. exchanges got shut down, Bitcoin's not going to die, but the growth curve looked like this, and now it's going to look like this. And so it just might take a lot longer for Bitcoin to win. You know, to, so I would say that's its biggest threat. I don't think it could kill it. That's its biggest threat. Um, I don't really see much competition from alts. A lot of people also have the they kind of confuse central bank digital currencies with cryptocurrency. So Bitcoin isn't just a digital currency. It's a gold 2.0 and it, ha it has gold 2.0 characteristics due to elements like scarcity, which you don't have in a traditional fiat bank sort of, sort of way where in the central banking system, we trust that they won't print more, but there's no guarantees of the trust. Whereas in Bitcoin, we don't have to trust Bitcoin. We have guarantees that there will only be, only be 21 million. 
Um, so those are very distinct differences. So I think, you know, the only way that Bitcoin, uh, to kind of wrap up, the only way that Bitcoin can die is if we, if a government continually and unanimously across the world, which, you know, the governments across the world haven't come together to solve climate change. So I highly doubt they're going to come together to stop Bitcoin, especially when the incentive for there to be confederate nations and nations that break away from the majority group to buy Bitcoin ahead of everyone else. That, that temptation is too irresistible. And so from a game theory perspective, it's very unlikely, but let's see if all the governments across the world came together to ban it. It certainly wouldn't be good for Bitcoin. It would very much damage its long-term growth. Um, but I'd say by the next cycle, at the peak of the next cycle, when Bitcoin hits a two to 10 trillion market cap, all bets are off in there because then you're going to have different governments buy it as a central bank, like the central bank will buy it itself. Um, and by that point, it'll be too resilient to, to where governments can, they can damage it, but it still won't alter the growth trajectory as much as it could now. But that's what's kind of funny about Bitcoin is as when it's small, no one cares. As it grows bigger and becomes more of a threat, then governments finally respond to it, but by, the, but that, but by that point, it's too late. <laughs> you know, if 30% of your population owns Bitcoin, if you ban it, then you're not going to be elected. Right. And speaking of that, in the last week or the last few weeks, we've seen, well, we've just seen Goldman Sachs encourage all of their clients not to buy Bitcoin and use some sort of FUD from like the early days as to why. But also we've seen JP Morgan extend banking services for the first time ever to do two of the biggest crypto exchanges. And you have one of the, are a part of one of the biggest crypto exchanges. So do you feel that banks, central banks are warming up to crypto? Or is yeah. that going to be the last thing that happens? I'm not sure about central banks, but you know, we had Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, say that Bitcoin is a speculative store of value. He said that last, I think that was last year. I consider that a glowing endorsement. <laughs> the world reserve currency, the head of the world reserve currency essentially says that Bitcoin is a contender, which is wild. I mean, it wasn't even recognized as legitimate until a few years ago or, you know, institutionally legitimate like that. Anyone can even talk about it in a semi-legitimate manner. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I see these commercial banks like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, or, you know, these investment banks, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. Um, JP Morgan is very much deciding to bank different Bitcoin companies. I think that's huge. Uh, Silvergate, which is a great company, you know, I think was a, is a weakness if Silvergate is the only bank that a lot of these Bitcoin companies use. I think they're a great company, by the way. Um, they're super popular in the space and they have phenomenal a phenomenal team over there. Uh, so I think diversification or decentralization is probably good for the, the network. Um, you know, when it comes to Goldman, Goldman has no incentive to show Bitcoin because it's not a Goldman product. That's not a bundle of mortgages. It's not a bundle of bonds. It's not a bundle of equities. It's digital gold that they can't really repackage and resell to their to their customers. So there's no financial incentive for them to shill it. However, the research report looked like it was written by an intern uh, who had mental health issues. Um, <laughs> essentially, it's like they were teleported back to 2013, copy pasted a couple journalist articles on why Bitcoin's bad and used that as a research report. Um, like saying, you know, proof of work is, is wasteful. Uh, Bitcoin's volatile, it's like tulips. Um, yeah, it's like a, you know, the longest bubble that's ever occurred if it's tulip-esque style. Someone, someone plotted over time the tulip bubble and all these other little bubbles and then Bitcoin and it's just this long, long perpetually popping upwards, I guess. Right. Um, amongst other misconceptions, or the Bitcoin's used for illicit activities when in fact the US dollar as a percentage of transactions has a higher illicit activity percentage. So all of these are traditional 2013 era FUD. It was a little disappointing because of course we don't expect Goldman to give a glowing review of Bitcoin, but at least they could have done a little bit better job on the, uh, the fear, uncertainty and doubt that they surfaced. Probably only going to go about like 10 more minutes and we'll wrap things up, get the, get the final questions in. I did want to like ask Dan, you know, coming from a Bitcoin minimalist, Bitcoin maximalist, Bitcoin fundamentalist point of view, his thoughts on some altcoins, just generally speaking, if you want to get into that. Well, we've just had a super chat from Mike asking, what are your thoughts, positive and negative? No, I'll, I'll ask that. I'll, I'll set oh. that up. He was going to ask about Ethereum, but I have specific questions. Uh, first of all, um, what like... Uh, because I know that you and Pierre, two of the leadership at Kraken, are huge Bitcoiners. What is Kraken's philosophy, or what is your philosophy, just generally being a Bitcoiner, about you know listing things other than Bitcoin? Yeah, so I'm a libertarian first and foremost. I believe that people are able to make their own decisions when it comes to purchasing and buying and selling different types of assets. 
I think Jesse is an incredible uh, person in the space. He's one of the most crypto, you know, Bitcoin ethos sort of dudes. I don't think he's a, he's not 100% Bitcoin. I think he's just more of a, a very, very sharp, uh, you know, company builder where he loves to go build something that people want. And so he very much respects libertarian ideology. That's very much woven through Kraken's culture. So being a libertarian, you know, Jesse has an, allowed me and others to speak very freely, even though I don't think he agrees 100% with my views, which I think is incredible because that shows a lot of like respect for other people's opinions. So I've got a tremendous amount of respect for Jesse. Also, he put in tens of thousands of his own Bitcoin into Kraken uh, to get it up and running. So, you know, Jesse, unlike a lot of other Silicon Valley startup founders, put in his own capital, which is huge. And so Kraken's in a great spot today. I think it's, that's a lot to do with Jesse's resiliency and that culture. Um, you know, I think Kraken, like in terms of the coins we list, we've never charged a listing fee. So we've never ever charged a listing fee. The process is pretty transparent. We have a team that's set up to be transparent so no one has information before anyone else. Um, so Kraken, I think very much adheres to everything being fair. Um, same with on the, on the uh, trading side. So we don't have any rebates. We don't have any secret fee tier structures. What you see is what you get as a, as a, you know, as a regular person or a market making firm. And so we very much respect the fairness of participation in the market. Now, as a Bitcoiner and personally, I only like Bitcoin, but I do respect um, other people's want to buy their assets. And I work at Kraken, so at Kraken, I, I help Kraken do whatever it needs to do to go fulfill those needs of our customers. Cool, cool. And I guess just generally, now not talking about Kraken, but just your thoughts, why not altcoins? Why is it just Bitcoin, Dan? Come on, why not altcoins? So I, I've seen 10,000 cryptocurrencies come and go. <laughs> then people forget that there's a 2014 altcoin bubble. And a lot of people like to marginalize Bitcoiners and they go, oh, Bitcoin maximalists, they, didn't, they never even checked out other altcoins. <laughs> I did. I bought and sold ETH. I day traded Litecoin. I mined PrimeCoin. I mined a whole block of prime coin because I thought it was going to do something more useful with a proof of work. That was back in 2014. And, you know, I didn't hodl well in 2012, early 2013. You know, I day traded a little bit. I wasn't very good at it. Um, and then I learned to hodl. I learned why Bitcoin was valuable. I learned about the scarcity element. Um, you know, blockchain tech was purpose built to build Bitcoin. You don't build a tank and then go, oh, we can just swap this tank out and use it for ride sharing or planting a garden or all these other util all these other functions. Blockchains make extreme trade-offs. They trade off almost everything to have this super resilient architecture to preserve data and preserve these transactions and order them in a certain function across multiple computers across the world in an adversarial environment. You know, you don't build a tank for a hostile civilian environment, you build it for a really intense military uh, war zone type environment. And that's what Bitcoin is built for. So, you know, first and foremost, blockchain tech was built to build, build Bitcoin. Um, we've had enough experiments now to where one of these should have competed and flippened Bitcoin by now, if the value prop of that blockchain or that cryptocurrency had been greater than Bitcoin. Uh, these are network effect plays to where as the network effect grows stronger, Bitcoin grows stronger as well. The price increases, the liquidity increases, the number of tools and projects and wallets that support it increase. And this is past such a point that I don't really think there's going to be another contender that can create a new network effect that would be as large or larger than Bitcoin. That first mover advantage is huge. Um, not only because it was done extremely well, Satoshi made sure that everyone perceived Bitcoin as being launched fairly. <clears throat> and unlike any other founder in the world, including Vitalik, uh, Satoshi never touches coins, uh, whereas Vitalik did and same with Jeff Bezos and everyone else. Satoshi, like Prometheus, sacrificed himself for the greater good of humankind in terms of his stash. So by every single mean necessary, Satoshi wanted to make sure Bitcoin was launched fairly. There's no expectation of value. <clears throat> it survived and grew and it survived civil wars. It survived liquidity issues. It was the first mover. Its, its commitment to the rules set within the protocol are a pro, not a con. A lot of Silicon Valley fundamentally doesn't understand Bitcoin because their web app or their mobile app needs to be updated every week because they're, they're, you know, it's a weather app that they need updated and they're pushing new weather data APIs and there's new GUI interfaces. So change is constant in Silicon Valley. We're always shipping something new. But with the money, you don't want that. And that's what Bitcoin's brilliance was, is that it's got a 21 million hard cap. And so when we compare and contrast that with other cryptocurrencies, 
you know, we've got code that is agreed upon by different participants and we all buy into the native token, Bitcoin. And because we buy into those rules that Bitcoin set out. <clears throat> and when we look at Bitcoin, how confident are we that the 21 million hard cap will never change? You can never be, you know, 100, 100% sure confident but you can be 99.99999999% sure. Bitcoin or trust in Bitcoin's monetary policy is greater than any fiat currency and any cryptocurrency in existence. So, you know, I can trust that those 21 million Bitcoins will preserve their value because there will never be 22 million. There will never be 20 million. It'll be 21 million. And that's critically important because trust is required to make this all work. And our trust and belief in this trustless architecture, you know, is really what enables Bitcoin and so when we look at other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, what is Ethereum's you know, monetary policy? They claim it's uh, whatever amount is needed to be printed to secure the network. Well, that sounds just like the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is a bunch of old men in the room who dictate monetary policy based on really poor inputs. And the Ethereum community as well as a group of developers in a room. And they don't necessarily know every single aspect, they're guessing. It's impossible to choose an inflation rate so Bitcoin's choice uh, function to have that. So the overall, it's the 21 million hard cap, the belief and trust in that 21 million hard cap, the network effect, liquidity, et cetera. Um, it's duration. People also forget that time plays a really critical, important factor in this. Even if we could trust, somewhat trust that Ethereum's monetary policy doesn't change after today, it'll never have the accumulated trust that Bitcoin has because it has 10 years so they're always perpetually behind in terms of that aggregate trust. Like that's how, that's how money works on Wall Street is they work with other trusted counterparties and time is the only way you develop that trust. You have, to, you have to do business together. You have to build trust with each other. There's no way to snap your fingers and be like, cool, we trust each other now. So, you know, I think these are all the reasons as to why Bitcoin versus alts, why Bitcoin is the, the value. Bitcoin is the one currency that I would recommend that everyone get. I love it. And I do want to take a, we have a super chat question. We probably only have time for a few more minutes. I do want to talk about Dan's YouTube channel. Again. All right. All right. So one more question. I wish there's so many more questions we could go over. But well, let's just do a little rapid fire, like, you know, for Paul. Yeah. I'll give you guys 30 second answers this time. No, no, <laughs> I, uh, please take as long or short as you want. Somebody super chat at 50 bucks and, much. and said, uh, what, um, what is not financial advice, just opinions. What is the best way to store Bitcoin? Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, so depends on how much trust you have in yourself. The ultimate goal of Bitcoin is to do self-custody. What that means is you put it on a Trezor or Ledger, and then you would back up that Trezor or Ledger. You get a 12 to 24 word backup code. You put that on titanium or steel metal. That is the most resilient way to store your own Bitcoin. Now, if you're afraid of messing that up, I would probably recommend you try a custodial service. That is a Kraken or Coinbase or someone else you trust that they won't run away with your money or that they won't be hacked. However, that likelihood is somewhat low. Um, well, well, it depends. No one knows what will happen with these companies. You are trusting them to safeguard your Bitcoin. But if you trust them more than you trust yourself, you should probably trust them because I know a lot of Bitcoiners lost their Bitcoins back in the day because of very complex sort of structures. So, you know, maybe put a little bit on there and put a little bit on the, the Trezor. And then as you become more comfortable with it, move more and more money off. But so that, that's how I would think about it is, is how much do you trust yourself in setting it up? It's not that difficult, but the consequences of not doing it correctly are pretty bad because you lose all your money. Mm -hmm. And we are definitely going to end the stream in like two, three minutes. Uh, before we get to one of the final questions, again, guys, uh, Dan Held uh, has had his YouTube channel for a while, but he's going to start posting weekly content, breaking down hard concepts. I've always been a subscriber, so you guys need to get on board. I, my personal goal for Dan is to get 5,000 subscribers by the end of the day. I know that's a lofty goal. We've already had over 200. Yeah, we've had over 200, and you know most people are going to watch this within the next 24 hours. Um, but if you want to subscribe to Dan, give him a chance. You know, Make sure you watch a couple of his future videos. I definitely recommend it. Great guy to learn from in the space, in my opinion. I love it. Um, hey, so we have a super chat. I have a final question. Maybe Aaron will have a final question. Nope, these two questions, then we're done. Okay. Uh, going to the super chat from Dave from David. Could governments hoard BTC, then create a BTC-based fiat coin that they could print more of and, and inflate? 
wouldn't that create similar issues to what we have now with the dollar? Yeah, so to change Bitcoin's 21 million hard cap would require all the network participants to agree upon that. You know, when I said before that Bitcoin really lives in our minds, it, it basically does because we each choose to abide by the 21 million hard cap rules. And so, you know, Bitcoin doesn't have a proof of stake system and a proof of stake system, you, would, you might be able to do something like that, where if you own X percentage of coins, you can change the rules. The Bitcoin doesn't have that. It's sort of a, it's a, uh, you know, like those Western movies where you got all the guys pointing guns at each other. It's like the miners, the node runner, the node and, and hodlers and the businesses, and they're all kind of pointing guns at each other. And so to change those rules, you know, the majority of Bitcoiners wouldn't choose to, you know, dilute their, <laughs> their net worth by printing more money. So uh, I don't think anyone would agree to run the rules by this, by this big uh, country that would decide to, to go, oh, hey, we think there should be more Bitcoin. We'd be like, cool, well, that's a different Bitcoin. So you're well, free I, I think it was fiat on top of it. Like we had a gold standard oh. and then fiat on yeah, top. Yeah, I guess there was kind of two questions there. So that on the fiat side, yes, I could see a future where instead of, you know, a lot of central banks across the world still have gold, same with like the US, Russia, and China. Uh, so these central banks own gold. So technically they could go back to a quasi gold standard. Um, so there could be a quasi Bitcoin gold standard. So, or the Bitcoin standard, if you will. Um, that is possible, but I think if they go back to that at that point, the citizen will go, well, why would I trust your fiat money? I'm just going to store my money in Bitcoin because that's my option. So it's kind of a lose-lose game for central banks. If they, Bitcoin will win. And so if you act like you're scared of it, you give it legitimacy and people go, wait, you control the whole economy. Why do you care about, <laughs> why do you care about this like digital currency? And if they flinch, the confidence game is lost. Um, if they embrace it as well, it makes themselves redundant. So sort of a lose-lose. Um, but yeah, either way, I, you know, I, I don't think pe people would necessarily want to have a, a dollar backed by Bitcoin because you just want to own Bitcoin. True. And my final question, just because we get this question so much, but for you personally, are you excited about DeFi and what is DeFi to you? That's a very good question about what is DeFi to me. Some people would consider Bitcoin DeFi. Um, I think it's a largely Ethereum narrative. So the Ethereum community has pivoted their narrative multiple times. They were a DAP platform, so DAP, uh, DAPs and platforms, kind of like apps and platforms, uh, very much resonated with Silicon Valley because they made sense to them. DAP platform, fundraising platform, AKA ICOs, both of those ideas are dead. Um, World Computer, which is what they sold when they did the ICO, their initial ICO, that's also dead. Um, so the narrative that they're pivoting to, pivoting to are that ETH is money and that ETH is, is DeFi or decentralized finance. It's a nice compressed narrative that makes sense. It's one of many that before it have structural flaws. Um, for DeFi to work, it requires immense amount of scaling and very theoretical engineering sort of things that need to be done, which I don't think anyone knows, including Vitalik. So, <clears throat> you know, BitMEX did a really great write-up over Ethereum 2.0, where BitMEX was basically like, LOL, good luck. And BitMEX research is probably the best research group in the space other than Kraken's research team. Um, and so, yeah, you know, when we look at it, it's like they're taking immense risks and challenges to do this DeFi thing. And DeFi currently, like a lot of times we find that it's very centralized. So there'll be a kill switch or the developers can freeze funds. Um, we also saw MakerDAO, which is one of the most popular DeFi products, have their game theory break where there's zero, zero dollar bids. And that was due to a variety of different factors, but needless to say, it broke. It broke in whatever capacity you want to say broke. I'd say game theoretic, it broke, or in terms of like the the bidding mechanism broke, essentially like no one bid. Cross, I'd say. Right, so, you know, you're building skyscrapers on skyscrapers in terms of complexity, game theory, code, et cetera. And it's hard enough to do sound money, you know, and if you start to build on top of that, these foundations are super weak. Um, and also the, a lot of these are engineers, they don't think about product. So I've got a background in product and marketing what problem are you solving with over collateralized loans? You know, I don't get a credit card because I have a bunch of cash in the bank. I get a credit card because I need to borrow money. Like all you're really doing is enabling wealthy whales to go borrow against their ETH and then buy more ETH, go so go levered, or they hope that ETH goes up. And so they borrow against it to pay for expenses today. But you know, that's, that's not like a huge breakthrough innovation that that sort of target user segment that would want to use that product is pretty small. And so, yeah, TLDR, it's, it's really complicated. TBD on value prop, um, it's a grand experiment. 
For Bitcoin, Bitcoin is going out for the largest total bill addressable market in the world, which is store value, which is hundreds of trillions of dollars of worth. That's all it's going to focus on, and that's fine. If it can do other kind of cooler things as well, that's great. But the number one problem with startups is about focus. And with ETH, they're trying to do everything, and that never works. You have to do one thing, and you got to do it well. Bitcoin will do that with sound money being a gold 2.0. And then if there's additional incremental functionality through side chains, lightning, whatever we'd like, sure, that's great. But that's not what we're here to solve. We're here to solve the biggest problem, which is the relationship between governments and money. We're about to break that. And that's what Bitcoin represents. And that's, that's what we're trying to achieve. And I'd also say that even if you are, if somebody is excited about dApps, the market, if, if all the dApps that will ever be successful, if there is any, that market is not going to be bigger than the market of money, just for some perspective. But anyway, guys, so much more we could ask Dan, but we do have to go. Dan, you'll have to come back sometime. I appreciate you being on, man. I had a blast. Thanks for having me, y'all. All right. Absolutely. Ending the stream.